Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Uh, for all my Canadian viewers, I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving weekend because that just happened here uh, in Canada. In the States it takes place next month, but here in Canada we just uh, came off of our Thanksgiving. Uh, over the course of the Thanksgiving weekend I got a chance to play my latest game that I picked up, which was Betrayal at Baldur's Gate. So I actually had the opportunity to play a scenario of this and had a really great time with it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we did make some mistakes playing through the game, but we still had a great time playing through it. So now that I've had that opportunity, what I'd like to do is just sort of give um, a little bit of an instructional on how to play the game. So kind of go through like laying the tiles and to, you know damaging to the damage to the heroes and things along those lines. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to do that first, and then I'll come back and basically give my thoughts on the game as a whole. So the first thing we'll do is just kind of go over an explanation of how to play the game. So to begin the setup for the Baldur's, or Betrayal at Baldur's Gate, uh, you simply kind of set the board up more or less like this. You have your two start tiles, which includes this three, uh, three room tile here that has the Elf Song Tavern, Inner Chamber, and the Kitchen, which leads to the, uh, the Catacomb level, which has the basement, uh, or the, sorry, the Kitchen Basement, as well as the Catacomb Landing. Uh, from there, you set up your character's cards, so you can pick from one of six uh, adventurer cards. So the one that I've just chosen here to show off in the video is uh, Avrixis Miserum, and she is a Drow Ranger Hunter, or sorry, a Drow Ranger with the ability Hunter's Mark. Uh, the clips that you saw in the unboxing video just go onto the card like so, and at the start of the game they all point at the green number, which is your starting number. As the game progresses, you may come into situations where you end up taking damage, uh, either physical or mental damage, and you can split that up between your physical and mental traits. So, for example, you have speed as well as might uh, for physical, and sanity as well as knowledge for uh, mental. Anything that causes you to take a physical damage, so let's just say, for example, you end up taking one point of physical, you can decide to take it off of your might or your speed. Now as you notice the numbers don't actually go down uh, in proper order so it doesn't go like 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 or anything like that. Uh, so what it does is whenever you take a point of damage to a trait you simply slide the... Oops. sometimes it slide easier than others but you just move the slider down a spot so one damage equals one spot down so for example if you end up uh, having let's just say I'm reduced to four speed and I take two points of damage to speed, even though I'm sliding down two, whoops, two spots, I still have the same speed, which is the number of uh, squares that I can move through during the game. Uh, the skull symbols represent death. Uh, now, we'll get to that later, because for the first half of the game, uh, the characters actually aren't capable of dying. So at the very least, uh, the, until the haunt begins and the true scenario starts, the lowest you can get down to is the number above the skull. Uh, but that's just basically the setup for the uh, the character and kind of explaining how the uh, the damage system works. Now some characters also have special abilities, like for example, this one here has the Hunter's Mark. So it says start the game with the Hunter's uh, Mark's token. Uh, once during your turn, you may place that token under an opponent within line of sight. Add one to the result of attack rolls against that opponent. The token is returned when the opponent is killed. So you get basically this here. Now there's also a series of six, and these are really hard to see, but uh, to show up on camera, but you get six of these small tokens as well that match each of the characters. And I'll explain sort of what they do uh, momentarily, but it's important that you have those there as well. So in addition to the, uh, the drow that I have here, of course you've got uh, the human. Now these are also all double-sided, so if I play this uh, using this mini miniature, I can either play as Azada Reshka, the human monk, or I can play as Mish Mishka Silversong, uh, the human bard. So each of these actually has uh, two sides, so we've got like half-orc cleric or half-orc paladin, uh, the dwarf uh, barbarian, or Dwarf Fighter. Yep. And we've got the uh, Human Sorcerer, or Human Wizard, so that the miniature still sort of makes sense. And then you've got the Halfling Rogue, or uh, the Halfling Druid. And on the other side of this Ranger, 
is a warlock. If I can get it to, there we go. So basically each of the 12 uh, player character classes that are available in the player's handbook for D&D 5th edition are represented in this game, although you can only have a maximum of uh, six players at any time. So to determine who goes first, uh, you actually have a series of these uh, just rules explanation or uh, sequence of play uh, explanation cards. Most board games have these. But what's interesting about these ones is they're all numbered on the bottom. So basically what you do is you take however many players that you've got. So for example, I've got three miniatures set up on the table. So you just take the ones that are numbered one, two, and three. You shuffle them so that you don't know which one is which. And you deal these to each of the players so that they are uh, showing like this. So you don't actually see which one has which number. Uh, once everyone gets their cards, they can flip them over and whoever has number one will be the first person to go. So again, we've got our starting tile set up, and we've got our different stacks here. So in order to explore, you basically take our turn, and so let's just say in this case, our ranger goes first. So I want to move her, uh, let's just say I want to move her outside of the Elf Song Tavern. So I come down here, and I say I'm going to go into the streets, basically. So you look at the, uh, the color of the doorways, and I'll show it off here. So this doorway has a yellow uh, border around it. This one has a red border around it. And if you look in the catacomb levels, they all have a blue border around them. So that just tells you which stack you're going for. So the yellow ones, you're going to draw from the street stack. For the red, you draw from the building stack. And for the catacombs, you draw from the blue stack. So. Going back to our earlier example, uh, the drow will move here and decide to go outside. So I draw the top tile on the stack, and what I get here is the beloved ranger statue. So it also comes with a special ability, which I'll discuss here in a moment. But the way that you place these tiles is, has to be done in a way that's as logical as possible. Now, uh, I did make some mistakes when we played this. I only got to play one game of this, and there were definitely some mistakes made, but I did learn from them. So the color of the doors when it comes to uh, placing it to, in order to move into it don't actually matter, and that's something that I thought did. I thought that they had to line up. Now these are just open archways, and I'm not... Honestly, I'm going to be honest, I don't think you can connect them to doors, so I think uh, you have to, again, it has to sort of make sense, is what they say. Now, there are ways that you can actually end up blocking things off, which is another thing that I got wrong before, but let's just put this like this so that the doors line up. You then move into the space, and um, now, the way that the rules work is, if you have to draw a card for anything, it ends your turn. But, I didn't actually draw a card for this, so if I wanted to, I could continue to go along. So let's just say that I continue to move and I draw another uh, street token just because I'm going to go this way. So this one leads to the City Harbor. Now what's interesting about the City, or sorry, not City Harbor, the Grey Harbor. What's interesting about the Grey Harbor is that you can exit through here into the catacomb landing. So this little sewer grate here is a one-way uh, trip that we can take you from there and if I wanted to, I can simply move, spend one movement to go from there to the catacomb landing if I wanted to go down into the lower levels. So now that I move here, and I'm just going to slide this up a bit. Just trying to make as much of this stuff fit into the uh, camera view as possible. All right, so once that happens, I have to draw a card. And I'll get to that in a moment. What I'm going to do is just set up a few more tiles, um, just assuming that some other characters have gone. So let's just say that we have uh, the halfling go out this way. And let's just have our wizard actually go down into... Uh, and let's have our wizard come out here. Alright, so now that we've got our board set up, we've got a few different things that I actually want to discuss and go over. So several of the tiles you're going to see are going to have these symbols on them, either like a bull skull, a swirl mark, or a raven. So these basically determine what cards you have to draw on your turn once you unveil that, uh, that particular square. 
So you only do this the first time that you enter it. So that's when you basically place the tile down and uh, move into it. So that forces you to draw the card. So the Grey Harbor was the first one that I did. So I'm going to actually do that one first, which is the swirl mark there. So that would be an event. So I flip over the event, and this one here just says uh, there's a treasure chest here. Pristine and shiny, just waiting for someone to plum, uh, uh, plunder it. So you just go through and you resolve the rules text here. So you may open the chest by rolling two, uh, or sorry, rolling two dice and discarding this card. Uh, so if you choose not to open the chest, place a square treasure token or treasure chest token on this tile and this card near it. An adventurer on this tile can open the chest as described above, removing the token and discarding the card. So there are uh, tons of tokens that are provided. I just have them bagged up because there's just way, way too many to go over. Um, but we have here, if you can see it, that's just what the uh, the treasure chest token looks like. Again, there's there's tons of these. I don't want to go over all of them just because there's so many possibilities. But let's just go ahead and let's just say that my ranger is going to try to resolve this right away. So, roll my two dice. And not so great. I get a result of one. So, if I would have gotten four, uh, it says Curiosity pays draw an item card, which didn't happen. Uh, two to three, it's already looted and you find nothing. However, I managed to roll just a one, as you can see. Though I got a blank and just a one dot. So, uh, the chest is a mimic and tries to take your arm off. Take one die of physical damage. So that's where we get to the damage that I mentioned earlier. So let's just roll the dice and see how much damage I would take. So, I take one. Now it is physical damage, it does specify that. So, the question is, do I want to take it off of my speed or off of my might? If I take it off of my speed uh, to start the game with, then it actually does reduce the number of squares I can move through. If I reduce the might, uh, it's still the same number. So, the, number, the significance of the numbers is if you have to roll a test against something, like if you make an attack roll, it's a might check, or if you have to make a speed check to get away from something, or sanity or knowledge checks, you roll the number of dice equal to the number indicated here. So if I make a speed check right now, I roll six dice. If I make a might check, I'm rolling three. Uh, now, if so let's just say I decide to take it off of might, that way it's not actually going to impact uh, my abilities to make attacks or anything at this point in time. So that's done. It's still three. However, I can only take one more point off of might before I run the risk of dying. So that's something I have to keep in mind for later. Now the Cleric uh, card, if you do use the half or Cleric, he does have the ability to heal a point of damage from any, strat, uh, any stat. But if I'm not really worried about that too much uh, right now. But again, just keep in mind that, uh, especially with this character, there's not much uh, physical might that they can take before they run the risk of death. But that's it, that's resolved. So the next thing I just want to do is go over and we'll just say the Halfling went next. So, we're going to draw an Omen card. So the Omen is Berserker Axe. So this axe was made to kill. It just needs uh, you to help it fulfill its destiny. So, you roll two additional dice when making a Might Attack with this weapon. If you are on a tile with one or more opponents, you cannot leave that unless you first attack an opponent with this weapon. You can't use another weapon while you're using this one. Uh, this omen can't be dropped or traded, but it can be stolen. And I'll go over stealing stuff in a moment. And it says to make a haunt roll. So, the way that you make haunt rolls is you roll a number of dice equal to the number of haunt to uh, tiles you've placed so far. So, uh, for the first little bit, it's really not worth making the rolls. The only way to trigger the haunt is to get a total combined result on all the dice of six or greater, meaning that the minimum number of uh, omen cards you can draw before you really need to start making those rolls would be three. So once you get up to that, you have to start rolling. But for the purposes of, of this, like I said, you just roll the uh, the one dice. So there's no way you can get six. So for the first and second omen card, you can really probably skip that. Now, once you do go through and, uh, and trigger the haunt, then you move on to the special scenarios. And we'll go over that uh, in a moment. But first, so we'll just kind of keep this in mind for the purposes of trying to de determine the uh, events that we're going to use. Now, the last thing that we have is an item card. I'm just going to do that, uh, just so you can see what those sort of look like. So, we got a ring of x-ray vision on our wizard. So, someone used strange magic to mount a living eye on this ring. Someone who undoubtedly placed utility far ahead of appearance. When you discover a new tile, you may use the ring to look at the top two tiles of that stack and choose one to draw. 
place the other at the bottom of the stack. After using the ring, roll a die. If the result is zero, discard this item as the ring slips from your finger and rolls away. So that's actually kind of cool, this item here, when you discover new areas. So let's just say that my wizard moves out here. So I can look at the top two building tiles because it's a red doorway. So we just look at those. Now these ones here aren't too bad just because they're both uh, events. But let's just say one of them, see if I can find one here. That uh, looks like we had a lot of events coming up. All right. So let's use this for an example instead. So let's just say you use your ring of x-ray vision and the two cards that you draw are the get it to focus here. The house of blood as one or the warehouse. So you can choose which of these that you want to use. Now you probably don't necessarily want to trigger uh, the uh, the haunt, so you can actually put this back at the bottom. This this particular one also uh, forces you to make a sanity roll. So when exiting, you must attempt a sanity roll of three plus. If you fail, lose one speed, but but continue moving. And then you've got the warehouse, which just gives you an item. So in this situation, I'd probably put this back at the bottom, and then I would just lay out the warehouse tile. So that's basically how drawing the cards and placing the tiles works. Now one thing before I get into the actual omen itself, or the haunting itself, there are some uh, ones here, some tiles that have rules text that lets you do something once per game. And that's where these little small markers come into place. So with the beloved ranger statue, which by the way is uh, used to be Minsk before he was uh, freed from being petrified, uh, it says once per game, if you end your turn here, gain one speed. So let's just say I move back here, uh, end my turn, I can gain one speed. So why don't we roll things back just a little bit. So instead of taking it off of my, uh, taking the damage that I took earlier off my might, let's take it off the speed. So let's drop it down one to five, because I knew that that tile was there. So basically I decide that I want to go and get that speed back and heal that uh, that damage. So you take these small little markers that again are really hard to get to, to focus. So you take these really small little markers, place it on the tile so that you know you've used it for the game and then you simply just put that back. Now, at this point uh, the decision has been made that we are going to uh, trigger the haunt. So let's just say we continue to build the board and we end up uh, getting the haunt to take place. Uh, just give me one moment here. All right, now I'm just going to look for a particular a particular tile here, and I'll explain why in a moment. The main reason is that I don't really want to. So I'm just going to do this. All right, so I've got the, uh, in this case, I've got Murder Row set up, and I ended up rolling the Haunt. So let's just say I've got enough Haunt things here that it's possible to get a total of six. I'm also going to say for the purposes of this video that the Berserker Axe was actually found here. And uh, the reason for that is basically I don't want to spoil any of these scenarios too much for myself or for the people watching. So uh, the combination of Berserker Axe and the Murder Row was actually what uh, the scenario was in the one game that we ended up playing. So I'm okay with talking about that one, but I don't want to go in and spoil all of the scenarios or learn about more of the scenarios. I kind of want to experience them for the first time as I go through. So we've triggered the haunt now. So we rolled... Oh. Let's just say we got that. So we got beyond a six on our haunt roll. The way that you determine what happens next is the person that reveals the haunt, so whoever uh, had the omen card or the omen tile that and rolled the, uh, the haunt uh, six results of six or more, consults the Trader's Tome. And the first two pages of the Trader's Tome is a chart. And the way that it basically works is you take the omen card, in this case it's our Berserker Axe, and then you cross-reference it 
with whatever the tile piece was that triggered the omen roll in the first place. So in this case we have murder row. So Berserker Axe, murder row, leads us to scenario 20. Out of 50, there are 50 scenarios in this game. Now, in order to determine who the traitor is, and not every, um, not every scenario necessarily has a traitor, uh, some of these are like cooperative and things of that nature. However, for scenario number 20, uh, the person that will be the traitor is the individual with the lowest speed. So, let's just take our three characters here. Now, let's just say that nobody's taken any damage uh, to any of their stats. So, we have, uh, we have a speed of four for both our uh, wizard and our... Yeah, let's just say we're using the rogue. So we got the wizard, the rogue, and the ranger. So the ranger speed is six. Uh, the halfling speed is five, and the wizard speed is four. So in this case, the wizard would end up being the traitor. Uh, in the event of a tie, I believe you end up, uh, if I recall properly. Okay, so here we go. So in this situation, it says. If I can get it focused. So if two adventurers tie in the same trait and one of them is the haunt revealer, choose the haunt revealer. If neither player is a haunt revealer, choose the one who's closest to the left of the haunt revealer. So there are ways to break break ties essentially. So what would then happen is your trader would find scenario 20 in the trader's tome and read through it for all of his special instructions and the remaining players would read through the secrets of survival. So in this case, uh, just going through uh, the trader's book, the scenario 20, or haunt 20, is they hide among us. And basically what this one is, is the trader is actually a doppelganger and not um, the hero that everybody thought he was. Uh, so when it gets uh, revealed, or when the haunt takes place, uh, the doppelganger's speed raises to 2, and then you collect square obstacle tokens numbered 1 to 2 plus the number of heroes. So in a 3-player game, uh, you would end up, uh, there would be 2 heroes, so you'd end up having 4 uh, chests after the haunt takes place. Uh, these represent treasure chests, shuffle them, and without looking at the numbers, place them face down on any of the tiles that you want. Um, so what you know about the heroes is they're trying to kill the doppelgangers you need to replace the heroes with more. Uh, you win if all the heroes are either killed or replaced with doppelgangers. And uh, so you must do this at the end of each of your heroes, uh, of each hero's turn. At the end of each hero's turn, if you are on that hero's tile, both you and the, uh, both of you must take the traitor's tome and dice and go into another room. Once away from the other players, if the hero isn't a, an unrevealed doppelganger, make an attack uh, against the hero. If you win, inform the player that their hero has been replaced by a doppelganger and let them read the next two sections before you, um, you return. If you lose, the hero is replaced. So revealing as a doppelganger, the player of a hero that has been replaced by a doppelganger should try to keep up the illusion until they reveal themselves by making an attack on a hero at an opportune moment. Once a hero is revealed as a doppelganger, they gain two speed, which we forgot to do, and can ignore negative text, uh, like any other trader. So, uh, traders, they ignore the negative text from certain squares, so one that involves you uh, having to make a sanity check to move through an area or take some damage, uh, they can ignore that. But if it has something beneficial as well, they can gain the benefits without taking the penalties. And uh, basically, when the heroes flip over the chests, uh, what they do is um, they... Uh, make a might, speed, or knowledge roll, and um, we need to get three or more. Uh, or sorry, three plus to open the treasure chest. If you succeed, flip over the token and announce what they have. So, if you flip over tokens one or two, it's a mimic, which ends up like attacking the players. Uh, if you get three or more, you get the medallion of thoughts, which is an item specific to the scenario, uh, which grants the wielder two additional dice on any attack or defense roll, maximum of eight dice and also makes them immune to being replaced by a doppelganger if they are a hero. Uh, keep the treasure chest token on your character card. It can be traded, dropped, or stolen just like any other. Now, I forgot this. I actually had the Medallion of Thoughts and I completely forgot about the fact that it made me immune to being uh, 
turn into a doppelganger. So we screwed that up when I was playing, and I ended up actually turning into one even though I shouldn't have. But it was still a lot of fun anyway. And then on a 4 plus you get to draw an item card. So basically the, uh, the scenario is you want to kill the doppelgangers if you're the heroes, and if you're the doppelganger you want to either kill the heroes or have them replaced by other doppelgangers. And you just kind of go through until you manage to complete all that. So that's basically just an example of one of the 50 scenarios. This was the scenario, that, like I said, that we ended up playing. Uh, so that was something that, again, I didn't mind discussing that because I just don't want to look at too many of these. I don't want to spoil uh, many of these scenarios. Now, there are a few that I know for sure are going to end up happening, uh, which are probably going to be more of the cooperative ones, I would assume. For example, there's one where you have to fight a dragon monster and fight uh, a beholder as well as a whole bunch of other of other things you can possibly uh, face off against. So there's lots, like I said, lots of scenarios, lots of different things that can happen in this game. Uh, so that's the basic gist of how you play the game. Now to make attacks, uh, for example, if you're attacking the doppelganger, uh, you would just simply make a might check against their might, or in the case of, uh, for example, when we played this, it was actually the sorcerer. Uh, that was the traitor, so he was using knowledge or sanity for his attacks. But anyway, that's basically how you play the game. You go through, you build the board as you go, you draw the respective cards that it requires you to. Uh, you can take advantage of certain tiles that give you benefits. There are certain tiles that are going to have uh, negative consequences as well for if you try to move through them. Uh, like, for example, I already showed it here, but... Alright, let's just look at Ambush Alley. So with Ambush Alley, if you end your turn here, you draw an event card. So you get one the first time you reveal it, but if you end your movement in here, you draw an event card as well. Um, so, I said just a lot of, uh, and this one here, Haunted, Haunted Alley, if you are, uh, when exiting, you must attempt to speed roll 3+, plus. if you fail, lose sanity. So, uh, there are things that can affect you, obviously, before the, uh, the haunt begins. But the haunt is really where the game really kind of picks up. Like, until the haunt occurs, uh, no damage that a character takes can be considered lethal. However, once the haunt begins, any damage that they take can reduce them to the Skull logo and have them killed. So that's, the, again, the basics of how you play the game. Uh, there are, again, 50 scenarios. This was only one of the 50, so there are 49 other ones. Uh, that I have yet to experience, but I'm hoping to actually get a chance to play them all out. Uh, one of the things that I do like is there is a uh, rule in here, in the, the rule book, that lets you know, uh, for example, selecting the haunt. So if you end up getting duplicate ones, you can basically choose the next, uh, the haunt that would be, like you could use the next nearest haunt or uh, omen tile. Uh, for your chart instead of the one that actually triggered it, if it would end up being uh, one that you've already done. So there are ways to make sure that you play through all 50 of these scenarios before you have to repeat anything, which I think is something that's really cool and really great. I, I really like that because uh, it adds a lot of variety to the game. Uh, so that's basically, like I said, how you play the game. Uh, so what I'll do now is just kind of move on to my final thoughts. Alright, so that was the basics of how to play the game. Now, the one thing that I stupidly forgot to actually mention when I was recording that section was how to resolve attacks. So, what happens is you usually have to uh, compare, you, you have to make a certain type of attack. Most attacks are going to be physical in nature and require you to use your might stat. Uh, so, you do that against your opponent's might. So, they would roll uh, their defensive stat, uh, their, their defense using the same stat. So with Might, for example, let's just say you have uh, 5 Might and your opponent has 3. So what you do is you would roll, uh, the attacker rolls their 5 dice and adds up the results. And, you know, so you've got the blank sides and the 1s or the 2s. So let's just say that uh, of the 5 dice you end up getting a total combined result of 6. So the defender then rolls their 3 Might dice and let's just say that they get uh, 3 total on those three dice. So what you would do is whoever gets the higher amount is considered to have won the skirmish and they deal damage uh, equal to whatever was left over like if you subtract the two amounts together. So for the person that got six and their opponent got three uh, you would subtract three from six and deal three damage to them which they can split up amongst their physical stats. Uh, same thing for mental. If it's a mental attack like with the sorcerer for example uh, they can choose either their knowledge or sanity and they make the roll based off of that. Now, in the event that the defender rolls 
a higher number than the attacker, which can happen, then the defender basically strikes back and you know defends themselves and actually deals damage back. So whoever does the higher t of the two numbers uh, applies damage in excess of whatever the difference is between the two. So again, let's just say the attacker rolled poorly and only got uh, two, for example, on their five dice, and the defender still got the total of three, so they would subtract the two from the three, and the defender actually deals damage back to the attacker. So that's something that I did forget to mention, uh, so I apologize for that, but I thought I'd catch it before the, uh, the video was over. Now, all that out of the way, uh, as far as what I think of Betrayal at Baldur's Gate, uh, to me, I think this game is fantastic. Uh, like I so said, we did make some major mistakes, um, and a lot of it just kind of went to uh, probably misinterpreting the rules the first time I read it through. Um, basically, I didn't have a lot of time to sit through and read the rule book. Uh, most of it was spent, you know, with family and doing uh, family things, so a lot of it was sort of an interpretation, which ended up being wrong in a lot of places. So, for example, at first I thought you had to line up the doors based off of their color, so if you went from a red room into uh, using a, a building tile, for example, that it would have to line up with a red door. Uh, but that didn't make any sense because we drew a street token, or street tile, which is the yellow back cards, and it only had a red door on it. So, there are definitely, so that definitely wasn't something that had to happen. There were definitely some mistakes made there. Um, we kind of screwed up a little bit on the rules with the uh, Medallion of Thoughts, or Amulet of Thoughts, which made it so that uh, the hero that had it couldn't be turned into a doppelganger, which I had forgotten at the time. However, the way that I revealed that I was a doppelganger was kind of fun, and um, it definitely was worth the, the payoff, even though we screwed up the rules. Uh, earlier in the game, I had found this uh, flask that actually contained a trapped um, Baylor. So, basically, you know, the doppelganger had already been revealed. The, one of the other players had already been turned and revealed as a doppelganger. So I ended up, you know, under the guise of having their back, you know, said, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll back you up, and I moved to their tile, and I made it sound like I was going to give them the medallion. It's like, you know, I have this, you know, this medallion that I found. There are rules that allow you to give it to someone, so I can trade it to you if you want. And then it's like, so what I do is I reach into my my pockets and I pull out this flask and uncork it, and this bailer comes out and attacks everybody. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, but what was really great about this game is variety. Now, I'm a huge fan of having multiple ways of playing the same game to get your money's worth, and this board game gives you that in spades. One of the other games that I really like, and I know it's not going to show up too much here, but I have the D&D Cooperative board games, which I'll do videos on at some point in the near future. But uh, with those, there's 12 different scenarios, usually within uh, the game itself, which gives you a lot of variety. This one gives you 50. 50 different scenarios, 50 different possibilities that you can go through before you repeat anything once. And there's a pretty good chance that by the time you get through the 50th scenario, going back and doing the first one that you ever did, you're probably not going to remember a whole lot about it. Uh, each of these scenarios takes roughly an hour to play through, so you're looking at about 50 hours of gameplay before running into repeating material, which is something that is really great. Another board game that I really enjoy was Assault of the Giants, which I have up there. But that is fundamentally going to be the same game every single time. It's just a matter of you may be playing a different faction type of thing. With this, you're going to have 50 hours of 50 different experiences, which is really cool. I also like the fact that there are scenarios in here that has everybody working together. Uh, I like the fact that there are scenarios in here that has one of the traders being, uh, or the trader being secret, so nobody knows. You all read through those, like the survivor's uh, guide, and what you do is there's little monster tokens that have just numbers on them, and you just, you know, again, shuffle those up, uh, numbered for the number of players, and deal them out face down, and everybody looks at their piece. Whoever has the number one is the traitor, but nobody reveals what their numbers are. So, you know, you try to create the illusion of working together until you get the opportunity to betray, which is really cool. So there's a lot of variety just even in those scenarios. So not every single game is going to have somebody uh, be a traitor or be an obvious traitor, which I think is really great. So the fact is that this is uh, probably, of all the board games that I have that are D&D related, this is probably the one that's financially gives you the biggest bang for your buck. Um, for $50 US or $65 Canadian, um, you're getting a lot of gameplay and you're getting a lot of variety uh, for that money. 
if you're American uh, picking this up at full retail, you're basically pay uh, paying one dollar per scenario or about a dollar for an hour of gameplay. Uh, so if you get through all 50 scenarios, you basically spent a buck for each of the different scenarios. Uh, I like the fact that uh, the miniatures that come with it are all painted. Uh, the paint jobs are basic, uh, very basic, but they're still painted, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, where most of these other games would just have them being just one flat color of plastic. Uh, like I'd expect like the wizard just to be red plastic, you know, the, uh, the half work to be sort of like a silvery plastic, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the bard or the druid being, or sorry, the bard or the monk being, you know, like green plastic. So it's really cool that they ended up, you know, making them actually painted. Uh, as far as the, you know, the tokens and stuff, there's a ton of tokens. I really just didn't have the, didn't really want to go through and show them all. Just because there's so many of them, but there's different monster ones that have little pictures on them. Like one is like a disembodied hand. I think some of them have like little goblins or stuff on them. So there's lots of different uh, little pieces like that that you use for the scenarios themselves. Uh, in terms of monsters as they are, uh, you don't usually fight them until you get to the haunt. The haunt is when uh, monsters will actually populate the board. So the first half of the game is just pure exploration and going through and resolving, you know, like omens and stuff like that. Now, even when the haunt begins, you can still technically go through and explore further. So you can still continue to lay down new tiles. It didn't happen in our scenario, uh, just because there was no real reason to. Uh, but it is something that can be done. Uh, you can actually end up playing more, more and more tiles as you go through. And I'm pretty sure, I, like I said, I haven't read through the scenarios because I don't want to spoil it. But I'm fairly certain that there are going to be uh, scenarios where you have to basically explore until you find a particular uh, spot. So uh, I'm not saying necessarily 100% that that's in there, but it just seems like it would make sense that you know you would have to go through and try to find a room. Uh, but again, uh, that's probably going to be one of the like the hidden trader ones. But anyway, uh, this is a really fantastic game. I really enjoyed it. Uh, if any of you guys have picked this up and had a chance to play, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, personally, like I said, this is probably my favorite of the D&D board games that I own. Uh, I always wanted to get House or uh, yeah, House on, or Betrayal at House on the Hill, I think it's called. So this is the exact same thing, only it's Dungeons and Dragons, which is going to probably be more better suited to my sensibilities. Uh, so this is awesome. I'm really glad that I picked this up. Uh, for a while, I was actually considering passing on it, uh, and I'm really glad that I didn't. So anyway, that's sort of just my my thoughts on Betrayal at Baldur's Gate, as well as an explanation of how to play the game. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, again, share your experiences if you played this, or if you played Betrayal at House on the Hill. Let me know what you guys thought of that game, because, um, you know, again, I think this is basically the exact same thing, only D&D themed. But maybe there are some, some subtle differences, so again, let me, let me know what you guys think. Should I try to find Betrayal at House on the Hill, or is this really all that I need for this kind of game? So, thank you guys very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.